God, well, hallelujah. We want to welcome everybody tonight to our midweek service. Amen. And uh, I want to share tonight on a, a message I started last week. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, let's go to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I believe tonight we don't have the, the scriptures up, uh, the verses up on the, on, the, on the screens. So we're going to go a little bit old school and we're going to have to actually use uh, our Bibles. Amen. Praise God. So in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and this, I've shared this before, happens to be one of my favorite scriptures because when I came to the Lord 30 years ago, I was a drug addict. I was a crack cocaine addict. I had already been through programs and rehabs, and I'd been with doctors and psychiatrists and psychologists and counselors and all kinds of things, and, and nothing could change my life. And, uh, you know, the one thing that they, they all had in common was that they, they would tell me once an addict, always an addict, Right. And so uh, I kind of studied psychology a little bit in high school and, and in college, and I really liked psychology. But from the very beginning, I always thought that was kind of, uh, you know, a, a contradiction in terms. How can you tell someone that is trying to change, uh, right, that is going through some type of rehab or, or some type of counseling that regardless of, uh, you know, if they stop doing drugs or stop consuming alcohol, regardless of that fact, they're still going to be an alcoholic or a drug addict. And that never really, that never really, uh, you know, uh, I, was, I never really understood that. So when I came to Christ, this was the first verse that I learned and that I memorized. And 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, new things have come. And when I read this, I remember saying to myself, I can believe in this. You know, I can put, I, I, I can put my stock in this. I can really believe in this. This is something that is encouraging. And that's exactly what happens when one comes to Christ, he becomes or she becomes a new creation, a new creature, the Bible says. All things are passed away. Behold, new things have come. So right there where you're at, let's pray tonight. And let's ask Jesus, let's ask the Holy Spirit to open our hearts, open our minds, our understandings, our spirits, so that we can receive the word that God has for us tonight. Amen. So, Father, in Jesus' name, Lord. We want to thank you for everyone that's here in the sanctuary tonight, Father God, for everybody that's here in the service tonight, physically, Lord, as well as for those who are watching us, uh, Lord God, on Facebook and, and online. And Lord, I just pray that you speak to our hearts tonight. Lord, help us to become the men and the women that you want us to be, your children, the children you want us to be, the church that you want us to be, the families that you want us to be, Lord God. Help us to realize that in Christ, Lord God, we have a new life, Lord. Help us to live that life in a way that honors you, in a life that glorifies you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. I remember when I came to the Lord 30 years ago, I was, I was so excited with what God was doing in my life because I had, I had lived uh, the life of drugs and addiction for a, a, a pretty long time. And and uh, if anybody has ever experienced that, you know, it's the worst thing. It's, it, it's a horrible lifestyle, you know. And uh, I had gotten to the point where I had already exhausted all my avenues and, and you know, my family had really tried to find help for me. And, uh, you know, I, I felt it felt hopeless. And at the very end, you know, someone started sharing Christ with me. And it was at that time, you know, that they started, they would invite me to church. But really, uh, this person, uh, to me, it seemed like he was just bugging me and, and, you know, and telling me about Jesus and inviting me to church. And, and I remember, you know, uh, I would even tell him off and, and cuss at him. And, and I thank God that he was persistent with me and never gave up on me because one day I finally told him, you know, just to get you off my back, I'm going to go with you one day to church. And it was a Sunday morning. And, uh, you know, I had been uh, partying the night before or doing drugs the night before, so I hadn't really slept. And, you know, but I remember that morning uh, after the praise and the worship, you know, a real simple message was preached. And it was a message of the gospel, how Christ had died for me on the cross of Calvary, how he had been buried. And on the third day, he had risen again. And because he had risen, I, too, could rise to a new life. And, and I remember at the, at the end of the service, there was an altar call. And, and, and I remember that my mind didn't even have time to process the invitation. My body just got up, and by the time I knew it, I was there in front of the pulpit with a person to my right and a person to my left. And, and that was the day I opened my heart to Jesus. Amen. 
And last week I started a message entitled, In Christ New Life. Amen. And 2 Corinthians 5.17 again says, if anyone is in Christ, right? If anyone is in Christ. And I shared the importance of understanding this. I shared the importance of understanding in Christ as our position. And not only as our spiritual position, but as our identity. We need to understand that's who we are now. We are in Christ. Before we were in the world, before we were aliens, before we were, we were, we were strangers, but w- without hope and without a God in the world. But now we are in Christ, the Bible says. Amen. And that is a blessing. And that day when I received Christ, I remember, I mean, it was just a total, total change in my life. Everything changed. My attitude changed. My mind changed. You know, my life was transformed. And it's been, uh, it's been a, a, a journey ever since in my life with the Lord. Amen. And in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, the word of God says this, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Right? So the Bible tells us that we were taken from darkness, right? And we were brought into uh, the kingdom of his beloved son, into the kingdom of light. And I remember, I remember, uh, you know, really, really noticing that in my life, really feeling that in my life, how I had really been taken from darkness to a place, from a, from a place of, uh, uh, you know, that was just dismal. And, 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 and I could literally feel death tapping me on the shoulder, like, like telling me just a little bit more and I'm gonna, you're going to be mine. And I could literally feel death surrounding me. But when I received Christ, I felt that, you know, that, that change from darkness and coming into the, the, the light of God's kingdom. It was amazing. So the Bible tells us that we've been taken, each and every one of us. Now, not everybody was a drug addict. Not everybody was an alcoholic or, 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 or had problems like that. But we were all sinners. We were all separated from Christ, from God, because of our sin. We were all taken from darkness and we were all brought into God's kingdom. And this is what puts us into Christ into Christ, in Jesus. If we are in Christ, we are in him, in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection as well. That was the only reason why, you know, I was able to, to, you know, leave that life behind. I tried every way. I tried by my own strength, and I tried, tried through programs and doctors and psychiatrists and psychologists. I met psychiatrists who were crazier than I was. They needed the psychiatrist. And they weren't able to help me. Only Jesus can change the life of a person. So if you're hearing me out there tonight... And, and you need a change in your life. Believe me, nothing's going to help you. A relationship isn't going to help you. You know, a, a counselor isn't going to help you. A therapist, you're wasting your money. Please come to Jesus. Amen. He's the only one that can create something new in us, make us into new creations. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, remember, we are in Christ. We're part of his death. We were made part of his death. We were made part of his burial and his resurrection. So it says here, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. Look at this. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So it talks, it talks about our death with Christ, about our resurrection, about our life being uh, hidden in Christ with God, about our being raised up with Christ. And this is what the true Christian life is all about. Our spiritual growth and, and, and our development as believers and Christians depends on, on coming to understand the, the, the meaning of God's word when it comes to the message of the gospel. This is why Paul said, you know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. There's power in the message of the gospel. And it's not a complicated message. It's not a deep message. It really really is simple when you come to understand it. So as believers, our growth depends on our understanding of God's word. Jesus died for our sin, the Bible says. We died with him. 
That's what it means to be in Christ. He was buried. We too were buried with him. Our old self, the old person that we were, was buried with Christ because we're in Christ. And whatever is true of him is true of us. And he rose from the grave on the third day. Amen. Praise God. And we too. Amen. We too were quickened. We too were given life. We too were raised with him into a newness of life. Romans chapter 6. This is the in Christ principle. Amen. It's very important for us to, to understand this because so many Christians struggle, you know, in their walk with Christ. They struggle to live the life that God wants them to live. Because the spiritual truth it hasn't become real in them. Because we're in Christ. The Bible also tells us that we are to walk in Christ or to live in Christ. And, and many people struggle with this, living the life that God wants them to live. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, the word of God reads, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. And what that means is that we're to live our lives in Christ. We walk in victory when we know that we've died with Christ, but now that we're also alive with him as well. That's where our victory is, in, in the resurrection of Christ. Right? He paid the price for our sin on the cross, but the victory came on the third day when he defeated death, when he rose from the dead. And Paul understood this principle, and he wrote to the Galatians about it. And Paul was the one who wrote, I am crucified with Christ. He understood the in Christ, being in Christ, dying with Christ, and being risen with Christ. He says, I'm crucified with Christ, the old person that I was. Is dead, buried, crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. Now Christ lives in me, Galatians 2.20. There, there was a reason why Paul wrote uh, about this to the Galatians. Uh, there's a reason why Paul wrote to this about them, because it's a church that had issues, you know, with walking in Christ, with living the life that God wanted them to live. They had a problem with living in the Spirit, in Christ. And I think all of us struggle with this sometimes. And, and I mentioned this last week. Theologians have come to call this Galatianism, and, and that's coming to salvation. They, they named it after the church of, of Galatia, right, because they came to salvation. They, they were saved by the work of the Spirit because salvation is a total work of God. But as soon as they were saved, they went back to living the way they were living before they came to the Lord. Galatianism. And we read in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 through 3, I read this last week, you foolish Galatians. Paul called them, you stupid Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Who did you, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? He said, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? He says, you were, you were born in the Spirit, you were saved in the Spirit, that you are now being perfected by the flesh. They had gone back to the works of the flesh. They came to God, to salvation, but they returned to the works of the flesh. And that's what uh, theologians call Galatianism. And, and there's a way that God wants us to live there's a, there's a way that God wants us to live as his church, as his children. We're called by, the scripture calls us to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. In Colossians chapter 2 verse 6. In other words, we're to live in a, in a manner worthy of the calling by which we've been called. We're to live in a way that's worthy of our calling to salvation. And in Colossians 2 6, therefore... As you have received Jesus Christ, we read this a little bit ago. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. And Paul uh, admonished the believers uh, at Ephesus to, to, to walk in a way uh, that was worthy of the calling by which we had been called in Ephesians 4.1. And Paul says, that, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you. To walk in a manner worthy of the calling by which you've been called. He says this because there was, there was, there's a price to our calling. In other words, it's just something that we, it wasn't just something that we received just like that. There was a, there was a, a, 
There was a price that was paid, an unmeasurable price for our calling to come to God, to come to salvation. In 1 Corinthians 6.20, Paul says this, for you have been bought with a price. What was the price that we were bought with? It was the blood of Jesus, the blood that he shed on Calvary's cross. That was the price that was paid for our salvation. It says, therefore, glorify God in your body. Paul was telling him, glorify God with your life. And this is why Paul admonishes the church to walk in a manner worthy of the calling by which you've been called. Because there was, there was a price paid for that calling. There was a price paid for our salvation. It was the blood of Jesus. The blood of the Lamb. And this price is too high for us. It was too high for us when it comes to salvation only to, you know, return to the flesh. To step on the blood of Jesus like that. And Paul said it in, in Galatians 2.21. He says, I do not nullify the grace of God. In other words, I, I, don't, I, I don't take the grace of God, you know, lightly. Why? Because he understood that there was a price that was paid for it. So we're called to walk, to live in a way worthy. What does that mean for us today? As believers, as Christians, how do we walk or live in a way worthy of, of our calling? Well, last week I shared that uh, we're to walk in love. And God is love. And we're also called to walk in the love of God. And this means to accept one another, especially in the house of God, to be at peace with one another. And you all know that we live in a world that, you know, where everyone and everything is, is divided, even, even in God's house many times. There's way too much division. And Jesus Christ said in Matthew 12, 25, a house that is divided against itself will not stand. So to live in love is to live in unity. Ephesians 4, 3, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, Paul said. He was sharing with the church about the importance of there being love and, and, and peace within the church. Walking in love also includes a desire to meet the needs of others. If we're to really love one another, if we're really to express the love of God, there has to be a desire to meet the needs of others. In today's world, the whole world focuses on self. It's all about me, myself, and I. Self-promotion, self-exaltation, pleasing self at any expense, even at the expense of others. True Christianity, and, and I shared this last week, and, and this, is, this is worthy of note-taking. If, if you have notes or if you're taking notes, true Christianity is the wearing down, the sacrifice of oneself for the edification of another. That's what true Christianity is. In today's world, you know, about coming to church, coming to Christ, it's about what God can give me, what can God do for me, what can the church do for me. But that's not what true Christianity is. True Christianity is the wearing down of oneself, the sacrifice of oneself for the edification, for the betterment of someone else, of another. You know why? Because that's exactly what Jesus did for us. He gave himself so that we could live. He died so that we could have life. He sacrificed himself. And that's what we're called to do. Sacrifice ourselves. Walk in love includes the desires to meet the needs of others. And Paul told the church at Ephesus, do not only look out for your own needs, but also for the needs of others. Consider others more important than yourself. And you know, we live in a, in a world that is so self-centered. And that's what the flesh is all about, self. But in Christ, to walk in love means to put others First, walking in love also means to get rid of anger and bitterness, evil speaking. The Bible tells us this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 through 32. The Bible tells us, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. What does that mean? Do not grieve. What's another word for grief? To sadden, right? So that means that we have the ability to sadden the Holy Spirit, to grieve the Holy Spirit. So Paul says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness 
and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. And look at this. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving each other just as Christ, just as God in Christ Jesus has also forgiven you. Amen. We all love the forgiveness of God when we mess up. Amen. Right. But how about when, when somebody else offends us? Are we that quick to forgive them as we see God's forgiveness when we mess up with him? And, and, and the Bible tells us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. How? Through bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander. All these things are to be put away from us along with all malice, all wrongdoing. And, and you know... I lived a miserable life. I lived a bitter life. I lived a miserable life. And so I know what that's like. And I know that life is too short to live with bitterness in your, in your heart, you know. Life is too short to live with anger in your life and, and clamor and slander and talking about other people and, and just being miserable. Life is too short. In Christ, there's true joy. There's true peace. There's true life. But we got to do away with all these things. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ Jesus has also forgiven you. So walking in love means to accept one another, to be at peace with one another, especially with those of the household of God in our own homes. This is something that we should practice. Let there be peace in our homes. In your marriage, in your relationship with your children, let there be peace. It's only through the work of the Holy Spirit. It's only through being in Christ, being in him, and he being in you. That's the only way you can accomplish this. Walking in love means that you're to meet the needs of others. And again, the only way to do that is to be in Christ because that's the heart of Christ. To sacrifice oneself for the betterment, for the edification of someone else. And walking in love means to get rid of all anger, bitterness, and evil speaking. Walking in a way worthy of our calling means that we're to walk in love. And this is where I stayed last week. But it also means that we're called to walk in the light. And in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, the word of God reads this. For you were formerly darkness. Maybe some weren't as, you know, a place of darkness as, as dark as others, right? But... I can definitely, you know, relate to this. I was in a place that was really, really dark. It says, but now, now you are in the light of the Lord. Walk as children of light. And again, what does that mean uh, for us as believers? How does that translate for us? Well, we're to no longer to live like the world lives. That's what that means. Who lives in darkness. And there's so many Christians who live more like the world than they do of, uh, as children of God, as believers. And again, that is Galatianism, living like the world, being saved, but living like the world. And instead of the church bringing those who are lost in the world I into the light, what's going on today is that we've allowed, the church has allowed the darkness of the world to come into the church. The ways of the world. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 Again, the Apostle Paul writes this, do not be conformed to this world. In other words, don't be the same. Don't be formed in the same way that the world is, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And there's so many in the family of God that are living out of God's will. It talks about God's will here. And there's so many who are uh, in, in the family of God in the church who are living outside of God's will. And, and this is why so many feel unfulfilled. This is why so many in the church are unhappy with their lives, with the way their lives are. And you might be doing well for yourself. You might have a good job or a good career. You might be making good money. But, you know, it, it's, it, you feel inside like you're in a place where you shouldn't be or you're not where you should be, rather. Most feel like this because they're not where God wants them to be. They're not in God's will. So again, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Do not be conformed to the world. In other words, don't live in the darkness of the world. 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is. And we'll never be in God's will unless we can understand God's will, unless we're uh, uh, away from the darkness and we're walking in the light, unless we've been transformed by the, by the renewing of our mind, that we can prove what the will of God is. And the will of God is three things. It's good, it's acceptable, and oh yeah, it's perfect. But to understand God's will and purposes for our lives, for our marriages, for our families, we have to be in the light, not conformed to the world, but renewed in Christ. That's what the Word of God teaches us. In 1 John 1, 6, look at this. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in, what does it say there? In darkness. We lie and do not practice the truth. If we say we have fellowship with him, with God, but we still walk in the darkness, right? If we still walk in the flesh, in the ways of the world, we lie and do not practice the truth. This is what Paul was rebuking the, 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 the Galatian church about. We're called to walk in the light. We're called to walk in the truth of God's word, in his will for our lives. I was uh, listening to a preaching by Leonard Ravenhill where he says that the church of God is mainly sleeping, right? And he quotes Isaiah 52 and he admonishes God's people and he says, wake up, you sleepy Christians. He says, wake up. So many Christians are asleep in, in the darkness of the world. And you know what? You're, you're exactly where the devil, the, the enemy wants you. Living like the world. He, he doesn't really care that you come to church on Sunday. As long as you're living in the world. You can come visit church on Sunday as long as you're living in the world. And so Leonard Ravenhill was exhorting the church to wake up. In Isaiah 52, 7, in that same chapter, in verse 1, Isaiah says, wake up. In Isaiah 52, 7, he says, how beautiful, right? On the mountains are the feet of those who bring the good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. And, you know, a lot of times we feel like we're not doing what God wants us to do. Well, when Isaiah uh, uh, is... is, uh, is Telling God's people to wake up. This is, this is what he tells them that they should be doing. They should be proclaiming the good news. Proclaiming peace. Who brings good tidings. Who proclaims salvation. And that's exactly what we've been called to do. We've been called to preach the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 52, 11, a few verses down, it says, depart. Depart. Go out from there. And touch no unclean thing. Come out from it and be pure. You who carry the articles of the Lord's house. So not only are we supposed to be preaching the gospel, this where walking in the light, preaching the gospel, but we're also to come out of darkness and live a pure life before the Lord. And this is talking about living a holy life, separate, set apart from the world, dedicated to God. In Isaiah 52, 12, the following verse. But you will not leave in haste or go in flight. In other words, you're not going to flee when, when you leave the world. For the Lord will go before you. When he takes you out of darkness and brings you into the light, God is now before you. And the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Amen. And, and that's important for us to understand. Because when we walk in the light, the Bible says that he goes before us, and he he's also our rear guard. So he, he not only has our back, but he has our front too. And the Bible says that if God be with us, who can be against us? And when you're in the light, it doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter if you're going through a difficult time, if you're going through a struggle or an attack. God is your rear guard. He's taking care of your back, and he also goes before you. He's with us. This is, this is a new life that, that, we're, that I'm talking about that we receive in Christ. 
We're called to live a life worthy of the Lord, worthy of the calling by which we've been called. We've been called to live in love. We've been called to live in light. And to also walk away in a way worthy of God's calling, we're to walk wisely. Amen. And um, we have a home for, for men, and this is something that I always try to impart to the men. You know, that this is something that is, is missing a lot in, in today's uh, culture. Kids nowadays, they grow up, and they're super smart. They're super intelligent. And I have a conversation with my son sometimes, and I am amazed at the things that he knows, right? And, and today's culture is a, very, is a very informed culture, very intelligent, kind of like the Greek culture. But intelligence is different from wisdom. And what God is asking of us is to be wise. And wisdom is using the intelligence that God has given us. You might not have as much as others, but if you can put into action, if you can live what little you know, if you can live what you know of God's word in a way that pleases God, you're a wise person. In Ephesians Chapter 5, verse 15 through 17. And Paul says this, be careful how you walk. And there it is again. Be careful how you walk. And again, this is referring to how we live as Christians and believers. Be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. And this is something that we should always be asking God for. Lord, give me of your wisdom. Give me of your guidance, Lord God. Make, verse 16, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Amen. And, you know, a lot of times today we, uh, we tend to make a decision first and then come and and ask God later after we've already messed up. Then we come seeking God and, you know, help me, Jesus. And, you know, I made a mistake. And really, wisdom is making a good decision before you act on something. It's seeking God before you make a decision, before you do something foolish. Ask God's wisdom. Ask his direction. And the Bible tells us that we are to be wise, walk as wise men, not as foolish and that's what a truly wise person is, one who understands the will of God for his or her life, for their marriage, for their family. We're called to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. We're called to walk wisely in a way, that's, uh, uh, in the way that we uh, are part of the church. And so many Christians today are making unwise decisions because they're not seeking God first. You know, on Tuesdays we have uh, Tuesday prayer, uh, midday prayer, and, and that was one of the things that we were uh, sharing this Tuesday about is the importance of seeking God, of praying, waiting on the Lord. And he's given us certain promises in his word. But we have to be wise. So many Christians unwise, living in, 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 a, in a manner that is unwise before the Lord. The, this verse, the verse says that we should, we should redeem our time, right? Never waste our time. Invest into the things that are truly important, the eternal things. There are many who like, you know, the finer things in life, you know, and, and, and all their life revolves around having these things, and the shame is that we won't take any of that with us when we leave this world. And all of the effort that we use to gain these things and to receive to these things and get these things, all that would have been in vain. And Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose, what's that? His own soul. Exactly. We need to be wise people. We need to invest in the eternal things. Uh, we had our men's covenant ceremony this Sunday, and uh, before that we had our men's conference, and we were sharing on, you know, what it means to be a, a, a true man of God, what true godly manhood is all about. And, you know, one of the points is to invest in the eternal things. And the first thing is reject passivity, accept responsibility, lead courageously. 
That's what men have been called to do. And we're also called to invest in the eternal. Stop wasting your time investing on the things of the earth. And invest on the things that truly matter. The salvation of your children, your marriage, your family. Doing God's work, preaching the gospel, reaching the lost. Those are the things that will really impact eternity. Amen. We need to be wise people. We need to be sure of the priorities in our life. We need to learn to listen to God. Know what he wants us to do. And then do it. Know what the will of God is. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. That is true wisdom. When the desire of your life is to learn what is pleasing to God. And then apply it to your life. That is a, a person that is truly walking in, in, in godly wisdom. To walk in godly wisdom is also to be filled by the Holy Spirit. To be led by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 and the word of God reads, do not get drunk with wine. Amen. For that is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. Do not get drunk with wine. You know, I used to get drunk. Um, it, alcohol wasn't really my thing, but when there wasn't anything else, you know, you'd, you'd get high on anything. And, and I remember getting drunk. And, you know, it, it the next day when it would wear off, things were never better. That's why it says, therefore, that is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit. Because let me tell you, when the Holy Spirit indwells you and inhabits you and lives within you, that high never leaves you. That, that feeling never leaves you. The Holy Spirit in, comes to indwell Christians when they're born again and when they're baptized into Christ, the day of your salvation. We need to be filled with the fruit of the Spirit. And let me tell you why that's so important. We need to be filled with the fruit of the Spirit so that when our children see us, they have a desire to have also what we have. When our friends and our family and our coworkers who don't know Christ have contact with us. They might not know exactly what it is. They might not be able to point, put their finger on it and say, well, this is, a really God, this is a really godly person. He's filled with the Spirit of God. They might not understand that, but they'll, there'll be something that will draw them to Christ through you. To be able to walk a life, to walk in a way worthy the calling by which we've been called. You need to be not only filled with the Holy Spirit, you need to be led by the Holy Spirit. You need to be sensitive to the voice of God when he speaks to you. And, and, and you know, sometimes it'll happen through situations or circumstances. Sometimes God will speak to you through someone else, maybe a godly Christian or your pastor or your leader or someone that you know. But sometimes it's, it'll just be through that still, small voice in your heart. And that's the one that we miss many times. That's the one that we have to learn to be sensitive to. We need to be filled with the fruit of the Spirit. Filled with the Holy Ghost. When we are, that draws people to Christ. As we come to be in Christ, we, we come to be into a new life that we're called to live. In Christ, new life. Life in which we're to walk in a way worthy of our calling, of our salvation, in love, in light, in wisdom. This is a life that brings joy and fulfillment and purpose and meaning. A life where we no longer live for ourselves, but for our Lord and Savior and Master, Jesus Christ. And if that's you tonight, if, if you feel like you're not where you should be, if you feel miserable in your life, no satisfaction, no joy, no peace 
unfulfilled. That's because you're not going to find it anywhere else. You're not going to find it in a relationship. You're not going to find it in a career. You're not going to find it in making money and having all the creature comforts that money can buy. You're going to waste your whole life trying to find peace and joy and fulfillment in all those things, and it'll all be for nothing. The only one who can give you that peace and that joy and that fulfillment is Jesus Christ. So tonight, if that's you, I want you to bow your head right there where you're at. And we need to realize that the only way to get this new life is in Christ. In Christ, new life. If you realize tonight that there's an emptiness in your heart, and you've tried so many ways to fill it, and tonight you realize that you need Jesus, open your heart to him. Confess your sins to him. Confess your condition before him. The Bible says that if we confess, he is faithful and just. If we ask forgiveness for our sins, Jesus Christ is faithful and just to forgive us. And not only that, he's not only faithful and just to forgive us, but he makes us righteous. He cleans us. He makes us new creations. He takes the bitterness and the hate and the anger out of your heart, and he fills it with his love, joy, peace. If that's you tonight, I want to invite you to say this prayer with me. But let me make this clear. This prayer doesn't save you. It's a motive in your heart. It's a desire of your heart. And if Jesus truly is your desire tonight, say with me, Father, in Jesus' name. I realize that I'm a sinner. Forgive me, Lord, for all of my sins, for all of my faults, for all of my failures. Forgive me. I open my heart, and I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Wash me and clean me of all of my sins. Fill me with your presence. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, come take control of my life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.